Okay, Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum everyone and peace be upon you all. Welcome. So inshallah, the, th the topic today is on tawakkul and the power of tawakkul in our lives, the spiritual power, the emotional power. And I know, you know, many of us know we have to have tawakkul, right? But as I always say, it's about reigniting our mental and emotional connection to the things that we know up here so that they can be known here, right? So tawakkul is one of those things we need every single moment of our lives. <laughs> and we often take these teachings that we have in our faith for granted that you know we have these beautiful concepts that are part of our faith that we're you know taught to practice day in and day out but because we're disconnected from them we can abandon them we can forget about them so tawakkul is known as the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but it has so many mental and emotional benefits so not only does it serve us spiritually in terms of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it serves us, you know, cognitively. It serves us, you know, emotionally and how we, and, and, and it serves as a way to navigate our emotions in the most fruitful and the most beneficial of directions. So tawakkul in itself is a cognitive restructuring tool, meaning, or a cognitive, uh, cognitive redirectional tool, meaning what? Your cognition consists of all the mental processes that exist, right? All the, the functions that exist from, you know, collecting information from the world through your senses to processing that information, to interpreting that information, making sense out of that information. Your brain's constantly doing this and your heart constantly trying to derive uh, rationale, meaning and understanding, different levels of understanding from what we absorb. But many times, especially in today's world, many people are anxious and many people are increasingly anxious. And when we engage in tawakkul, what we're doing is we're trying to intercept that spiral of thinking that can increase our anxiety. Because anxiousness, you know, every, every human being experiences anxiousness. But what we don't want is we don't want it to get to a point where it takes control over us. And so we have to build this muscle, this spiritual, mental, and emotional muscle of directing our thoughts. And tawakkul is a great way to do that. You know, reliance on Allah, trust in Allah, directing our being, our mind, our thoughts, our heart, our emotions towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trusting in Him and His power and His control and that He is the source of everything we need. That is really powerful. But like I always say, it's a muscle. It's a spiritual muscle, it's a mental muscle, and it's an emotional muscle that we have to build. So trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is something we need, but many times, especially from my work with, with people, what I've come to know in exploring, you know, uh, it's not, uh, in exploring psychological barriers to our spiritual growth, one of the most common barriers that come up that keep people from fully relying on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one is fear of trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially if they've gone through a lot of emotional pain a lot of hurt a lot of experiences that were difficult if you have been let's say making dua for something and your du'as weren't answered many times people don't realize it but that affects the way they walk towards Allah again or their ability to rely on him in the future so sometimes I'll work with people and they'll say things like, you know, I, I used to be so close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I used to feel so connected. I used to feel, you know, nourished. I used to feel so engaged in my acts of worship. And I don't know what's happening to me. I feel like I'm disconnected. I'm doing all, I'm doing the same things, but I'm not, not eager to go like I used to be. I'm not as present. So oftentimes when people say this, it's, it's a disconnect, right? But oftentimes it's because the way they viewed their relationship with Allah changed. And a lot of times, it's also because Allah was the means, not the end. And we do this sometimes as human beings. You know, astaghfirullah, we tend to sometimes unintentionally make Allah the means and what we want, the end. 
So let's say they've been making dua for something, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something. Yeah, they're, they're, trust, they're trusting, but what are they trusting in? They're not trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're trusting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfills X, Y, and Z for them. So Allah becomes, astaghfirullah, the means, and what they want is the end. And so people do this and because we're, sometimes we're disconnected from ourselves. We don't take the time to assess what am I seeking? Am I seeking Allah or am I seeking my nafs? Am I seeking Allah or am I seeking this rigid definition of what I need to have in my life? Of what I expect to have in my life? What I think I'm entitled to have in my life? Many people struggle with this today. They have rigidly defined what their future looks like what their outcomes look like, where they should be by a certain point, certain milestones, they've rigidly defi defined their milestones for themselves. And then they go to Allah, telling themselves they're trusting in Allah, but really they're so attached, so rigidly attached to what? To this thing that they have expected Allah to give them. Many people don't want to say it, but then they just, but then they start to feel what? Resentful towards Allah. But I but I prayed in, but I prayed. I did tahajjud. I did dhikr every single day. I prayed more than I've ever prayed. I wore hijab, I did this, I did that, I went to every salah at the masjid, whatever it is that they did, right? They start feeling like, but I did it. And then they might look to someone else who doesn't do half of that and they might have that thing that they've been asking Allah for so then what happens? He, he's not doing half of what I'm doing and you gave it to him, right? SubhanAllah, there's an ayah at the end of Surah Taha that really, you know, exemplifies or really reflects this, this experience we have as human beings when our eyes look at what other people have and we start to have this doubt in our hearts, this questioning. Wala tumuddunna Do not look longingly at what people have. And Allah tells us, and, and I'm paraphrasing, Allah tells us in this verse that this is a test. This is, he, he has given them from this worldly life, but it's a test. And that what Allah has for us is better. So we sometimes look and we think, we think, oh, I'm practicing, I'm practicing, I'm doing, you know, all these things. I'm trusting in you, Allah. You know, sometimes trust with quotations, right? Because it might not be real trust. It might be trust in what you want, not trust in Allah. And then, and then we compare. Today, a lot of people are resentful. A lot of people are bitter towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they don't want to admit it. <laughs> Because if I, speaking it is the problem, not experiencing it. <laughs> you, get, you get what I'm saying? I'm being sarcastic in case anyone missed that. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like many times when I work with people be like, no, no, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, but they're experiencing it. And I get it, it's out of their humility in front of Allah. They don't want to, it comes from a good place. But a lot of times we have to face our reality internally. Because we're ready. It's not about whether you speak it or not. Allah knows what you're experiencing. Allah knows that you feel resentful towards Him. So that's why you're not the same way in your prayers. You're not as engaged. You're not as connected. And you don't want to do the same acts of worship that you did before. Because you're hurt. You expected something from Allah. Now you're disappointed. And so it speaks to a false belief that we have that I'm entitled to this if I do this. <laughs> I always say entitlement, especially now more than ever, we don't realize it, but the growing entitlement of our time causes a lot of problems. I think it exacerbates a lot of our struggles because who said we're entitled? Who said we deserve everything? <laughs> what did we do to deserve eyes that see? <laughs> what did we do to deserve ears that hear? When Allah gives, 
or withholds, it's never because we deserved it. It's because of who he is, not because of who we are. But what he does give, or when he does withhold, it is always because of his goodness towards us. And because he is doing what is in service of us. So then you understand, okay, he knows me. He knows what's good for me. He knows my plan. He knows what, you know, what's good for me, my dunya and my akhra. Everything he does, if he withholds, if he gives, it's because it's in service of me and him molding me. Him raising me under his eye. I've mentioned the ayah in the Quran before where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to Musa alayhi salam and he tells Musa, وَأَلْقَيْتُ عَلَيْكَ مَحَبَّةً مِّنِّي وَلِتُسْنَى عَلَى عَيْنِي And I have bestowed upon you love for me, from me so that you may be raised under my eye. This is not just for Musa alayhi salam, this is for each of us. He's molding each of us. Your tests, your struggles, what he gives you, what he withholds, it's all in service of this person he is molding you to be. When you feel that, and you believe it, not just up here, you believe it here, you know it here. You look at your life so differently. You might not be in the same place as your friends are, it's okay. Allah's molding me. You might not have, you might not have hit the milestones that you think you should have hit. It's okay, Allah's molding me. I keep making du'a for something and Allah's withholding it. It's in service of me. It's His love for me. But you have to practice this. <laughs> you can't just take it here and listen to it here and then go home and not do anything with it. You have to sit with it when you are alone with Allah. And you have to practice believing it, practice letting it settle into this heart of yours. So that you train your mind, you train your heart, more importantly, to look for Allah's love in everything. Rabia al Adawiyah radiallahu rahmallah. She says, she says, I look for a, I look for your love everywhere, and then suddenly I'm filled with it. <laughs> so beautiful, and it's true. You look for Allah's love, you'll find it. You look for His goodness, you will find it. You look for His mercy towards you, you will find it. It's everywhere. It's all encompassing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ta says in the Quran, My mercy encompasses all things. So you look for it, you will find it. But we have to train this heart to look for it, you know, to seek it, to go into the world and actively, intentionally, proactively look for Allah's presence in our life. He's there, but we're not connected to His presence in our life. So tawakkul is not just about, okay, I have this thing in front of me, I'm trusting Allah. No, tawakkul is believing in Allah's love and mercy for you and His goodness for you, towards you and His good plan for you, greater plan for you. Because that's what cultivates trust. <laughs> you trust someone when you know what? They have a good heart towards you, correct? You trust a friend when you know that she wants what's best for you. You trust a spouse when you know they want what's best for you. So you trust Allah by really believing that He wants what is good for you. That He loves you more than anyone else can love you in this world. That His mercy is greater towards you than anyone else in this world. Then you won't have a problem trusting Him. Then you won't have a problem having contentment and rida with what He has given you in life. Where you totally accept. Because you know that the one who is planning your life wants the best for you. That's where we start with tawakkul. Many times when we talk about tawakkul, it's in a very limiting way where it's like, trust in Allah, trust in Allah, but why we have to look at the barriers. <laughs> what keeps us from trusting in Him? It's our fear of getting hurt. It's our lack of really being connected to His love for us. So if you've been hurt 
before and you've made dua for example and you asked Allah for something and you 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 know you felt disappointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remind yourself because people can get stuck in this for a long time this phase by the way I've seen it happen where that pain becomes suffering because it's like the anger grows and shaitan of course feeds into this look you prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he didn't answer you Look, he gave it to someone else who doesn't even worship him, doesn't even practice. <laughs> oh, okay, well, I wore hijab, you know, and I didn't get what I want, I'll take off hijab. <laughs> okay, I started praying and I didn't get what I want, I'll stop praying. Be careful of what grows in this heart. Be careful because it can impact you and before you know it, it turns into anger and it consumes you. It becomes heavier and heavier to go to Allah, heavier and heavier to make du'a. But you need Him. You can't afford to be cut off. So try to nip it as soon as you realize that resistance, as soon as you realize that you're, you're, dis you're, you're becoming distant from Him. And, and as you're assessing this, ask yourself, what was I trusting in? Am I, am I upset with Allah because I trusted Him or was I, was I really trusting in this rigid definition? So in, a, in SubhanAllah, in a sense, we're not being honest with ourselves because we weren't trusting Allah. I, I was telling Allah what I wanted and I was asking Allah to abide by it, which is, think about it, it's like, right? It's like, I know better. Astaghfirullah, right? I'm, I'm saying things as they are, not as what we intend, right? The, the reality of it is that sometimes we don't notice what we're actually expressing because in, in, in through our actions. But when you're fixated on something and you're, you're like, this is what I want, it's almost like you're trying to get Allah to abide by your limited perspective of what you think is good. But guess what? You humble this in sujood to the one who is infinite knowledge. So Allah does not accommodate this. We, ha I mean, Allah does not change, you know, to accommodate what we have in our mind. <laughs> no, we humble this because we remember that what he, what he knows and what he has in store for us is so much better. So assess what you're disappointed in. Assess what you're really trusting in. Have a plan for your life. Have a plan for what you want. Hope, have hopes, you know, but at the end, practice freeing yourself from the rigid definition. A good way to do that is after you make da'a, ask Allah that if it's good for you <laughs> to give it to you. Right there, you're training your, your mind and heart to not be as attached to it. This is the whole point, you know, of istikhara, right? Is that you're, you're, you're asking Allah for guidance because He knows what you do not know. So if every time you make du'a, you add that and you say, Ya Allah, if you know it is good for me and I trust you, I trust you. Even if your plan does not look like this, I trust you. It helps you become more freer in this world. Less weighed down because everything you rigidly are attached to weighs you down. Mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And every time you can practice letting go just a little bit, it frees you. You walk a little freer. Your heart is more expanded. You have more room to breathe, to ask Allah to connect with Him, to be present. And then you get to notice all the beautiful things that He has already given you that you never asked for. You get to notice all the beauties in your life that He has already placed, all the ways that He is taking care of you, all the ways that He is guiding you. Don't be so fixated on what you didn't get or that, that, that the struggle in your life that you forget to see the bigger picture. You know, there's a quote, it's by Rumi, it says, you're asking for the drop when Allah has the whole, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but He has, he has the whole ocean for you and you're focusing on a drop. And that's sometimes what we do. You know, I, I need to have this, or I want this. 
And people get so fixated and because of that fixation, it really adds so much emotional stress. So we trust him by rooting ourselves in, in his love and remembering that no one will love us more than him. Even, you know, even our own mothers. Allah loves us more, right? And Imam Al-Ghazali actually when he talks, Rahimallah, when he talks about trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says to completely, you know, uh, trust in Allah is to be like a child who knows deeply that even if he does not call for the mother, the mother is totally aware of his condition and is looking after him. And you see this, right? You see when you ever the, the way a child will play when his mother is right there as opposed to when she's not there is different. A child will play so freely knowing that his mother is right behind him. And you see this. That's why I use the word freedom a lot because that's what you see in like children, right? They're, they're so free. But as we, you know, get older and as we have experiences and as we add on more layers to our lives, you know, we become a little less freer because we start depending on us instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A child is free because it's, he's, he or she is totally dependent upon its caretaker. So what does that tell us? We become freer the more we depend on our caretaker. It's like when, actually when I um, read this, I remember um, when I read this concept of, or definition of trusting in Allah by Imam al-Ghazali, I remember the, the, ins the when Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was walking with Abu Bakr when they were making hijrah. And Abu Bakr kept looking back, you know, kept looking, because you know, they're, they're, they're in danger, right? And Prophet Muhammad وسلم, didn't look back once. <laughs> That's trust. That's love. That's I know you have my back. I know you got me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, tells us in the Quran, put your trust in Allah, and Allah loves those that trust him. Because it's a you, you have to love Allah to trust him. But he loves you when you trust him. <laughs> so it's a beautiful, you know, I, I talk often about, um, and I've said this before here about, you know, if you look at any relationship, one of the foundational characteristics of a strong bond is trust. And that if you lose trust, like one of the characteristics of that you love someone is that you're honest with them and that you're truthful and that they can trust you. So it's a component of love. And if you don't have trust, it fractures the love between two people. And it has to be rebuilt for that love to grow, correct? So this is a relation this is a journey of love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says, if you had all relied on Allah as you should rely on him, then he would have provided for you as he provides for the birds who wake up hungry in the morning and return with full stomachs at dusk. And we should think of this when we are, you know, worried about something or we are worried, you know, about all the things that life can, can bring, right? Think of the birds. If Allah takes care of them and make sure, makes sure they are fed, how could he not take care of you? Right? So, remembering these things, especially when you're in a moment of, you, know, you find yourself, you know, being led by your thoughts or finding yourself, you know, thinking about all the possible what ifs and all, this is a good, you know, way to just bring yourself back. Have these little things that you refer to so that when these moments happen, but we should also be doing this before so that we don't just do it when something comes up. It should become a habit, right? That every day, even when things are good, trust in Allah and thank Him. Engage in shukr. When things are difficult, trust in Allah. So, tawakkul gives us this ability to direct our thoughts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this can help anxiety because 
a lot of times anxiety is associated with our, with our thoughts about the next moment. It's our thoughts about, it's rooted in uncertainty. It's our, it's anxiety is very often rooted in our relationship with uncertainty. But I want to ask you this, what is certain? <laughs> Even the next second is uncertain. The next moment is uncertain. It just, we think it, everything is certain unless we think of something that's uncertain. No, you're always actually living in a state of uncertainty. You just don't realize it. Because as human beings, we forget, you know, in sand comes from the word nesia, to be forgetful. So we forget, we forget how vulnerable we are. Yeah, we might, we're, we're not children anymore. We don't depend on our parents, but guess what? We're still actually in that fragile depend, uh, state that requires us to depend on our creator. Children sometimes may forget the, their need for their, for their parents, right? And you find them like, you know, trying to explore and maybe put themselves in dangerous situations and, and not realize, you know, like they need to listen to their parents because they might get hurt. We do the same with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We forget our vulnerability. We forget that we need him. We forget that we depend on him. And so, yeah, this dunya is uncertain. And everything from, except your very breath, and what you have in this very second is uncertain. So then we should stop treating uncertainty as the anomaly or the, the thing that like is uh, not constant and actually treat it for what it is. It's the most constant thing, thing in our life. So then, if I stop treating uncertainty as an intruder or this thing that shouldn't, doesn't belong here and I start thinking of it as something that belongs here and something that exists and uncertainty is all around me, then you can really take back some of the power that you give to that which is outside of you. And you say, yeah, nothing is certain but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And my, and my relationship with him. Allah is the constant, he's the one who is constant, ever living, self-sustaining. Al-awwal wal akhiru, the beginning and the end. So it's a great way to direct your thoughts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when you're feeling like, you know, you're, you're thinking about all the possible outcomes of something, you're worrying about something, redirect your thoughts back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try to intercept that spiral as early as you can recognize it. Get up and pray two rakahs. Powerful way. If you don't want to, if you can't pray two rakahs, just get up and make dua. No, say say some askar. Do do say astaghfirullah a few times. Say alhamdulillah. Engage in a gratitude check. You're you're utilizing now your mind to serve this heart, and you're redirecting it in the best of directions. Thinking well of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, you can't, and this is why I, I talk about love and having a good opinion of Allah because you can't let go. Like, what would make you, like, if somebody came to you and said, hey, you know, you can leave your bags with me, you know, you would need to, you don't trust someone with something valuable unless you know them. And oftentimes when people can't let go and they can't trust in Allah because they don't, they haven't really gotten to know him well. Because you can't trust someone you don't know, just like you can't love who you don't know. And so if you have struggle with tawakkul, then okay, before you let go, learn about the one who you're letting go to, right? Learn about him before you, okay, you, you're hesitant then know who your place you're entrusting with you, with what is valuable. You're entrusting with your worries. You're entrusting with your, with your struggles. You're entrusting with your affairs. And so you can't entrust your affairs into the hand of one you do not think well of. You know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, tells us in Hadith Qudsi, I am what my servant thinks of me. How many of us, you know, remember this? when we are worried. Ya Allah, I know you have my back and I know you said that you are what I think, like you, you will meet me where I think of you. Because Allah is al-haq. He is the truthful. He does not lie. So he will meet you with, to, to you know, he will meet you according to what you think of him. He will not let you down. He will not disappoint you. 
you know, if a child, you know, goes to their parents says, you know, like you could just see this in parent child relationships, the way that you, you go to a parent or, you know, I know you're so merciful or I know, you, you know, you're not gonna like even with children, like you see it all the time when children are so young and they go to their parent, I know you're not going to give me a consequence or I know you're not going to give me a time out, you know, because you, because you love me or because you're, you know, like, or just, it softens the parent's heart. This is Allah we're dealing with, whose love for us is so great. Who when he loves someone, it's a whole event in the heavens. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Hadith Qudsi that when he loves a person, he tells uh, Angel Jibreel, I love so and so, so love him. It's an event in the heavens. People want to be loved in this world. And never, we don't connect to what it means to be loved by Allah and his angels. that that should be our biggest concern. And when Allah loves you, it's not an event in, you know, on social media, <laughs> you know, it's not an event in your, in a small space in, in this dunya. No, it's an event in the heavens. Ya yeah, Jibreel, I love so-and-so, so love him or love her. And then Jibreel goes to the angels <laughs> and says, Allah loves so-and-so, so love, love him or love her. And then the people on the earth are made to love also this person. Allah is the one who controls the hearts. That's also trust. Is that when you go to an interview or when you have, you know, an important, you, you have to go ask your professor for something or, you know, you have something to you where you, you're required to go to somebody else and you are deceived. And this happens to all of us, right? We forget, like, wait a minute, why am I so worried? Allah is in control of the heart of this person. If I get this job, if I get this accepted, it's, it's, it's in Allah, his heart is in Allah's hands. <laughs> so then it changes the way you go to those interviews. It changes the way you go to, you know, um, anything that you have to do where you feel like, where you, you're, you feel like that person is the one who's going to decide something for you. No, Allah, his heart is in Allah's hands. I see Allah, even though I, I'm in this interview and I'm, my, my heart is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I get it, it's because Allah wants it. If I don't get it, it's because it's not good for me. It makes you freer. It also protects you from self-defeating thoughts. When you go to an interview and you have that trust that you did your part, you put in the effort, you, you are there. You know, when, when you are walking in with that trust in Allah, when you walk out, let's say you didn't get it. You're not gonna engage in, you're less likely to engage in, oh, I'm a failure, I'm this, I'm that, and negative, you know, self-talk, you're going to say, Alhamdulillah, Allah, I trust in you, and I know you have what's best for me. Imam al-Ghazali, rahimallah, he says, if the first inward thought is not warded off, it will generate a desire. Then the desire will generate a wish, and the wish will generate an intention. And the intention will generate the action and the action will result in ruin and divine wrath. So evil, or, or in parentheses, any negative thought, must be cut off at its root, which is when it is simply a thought that crosses the mind from which all other things flow on, follow on. SubhanAllah. This is Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, hundreds of years ago. <laughs> Today, we would say that this is very consistent with CBT, cognitive behavioral theories or cognitive behavioral therapy. Where the thought, we say that in cognitive behavioral theory or therapy, it approaches um, human behavior or human problems or the way we react as not a direct response to, an, to what happened, to an incident. It's a response to how we interpret the incident or how we navigate this. So, subhanAllah. And then I'll end with this, a beautiful du'a to make is Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, or taught this du'a by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Ya Hayu Ya Qayyum, bi rahmatika astaghith, islih li sha'ni kullu, wa la takilni ila nafsi tarfatain 
Ya Hayu Ya Kayum, all, all living, you know, uh, um, ever like ever living, self sustaining, right? Or no, Kayum is like eternal, always living, right? Um, ya Hayu Ya Kayum, Barahmatika Astafid, by your mercy I call upon you, or I'm, 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 I'm accessing your mercy. <laughs> Do not leave me. No, um, take care of like all of my affairs, all of all of what you could think of this as anything that you're struggling with, anything that you're thinking, take care of it all for me. And do not leave me. Do not leave me to myself, even for a blink of an eye. That's tawakkul. I don't want to depend on this. It was not designed for me to depend on it. As I always say, you are not the Lord of yourself. You have a Lord. I'll stop here and take questions. Thoughts, comments, does that have to be a question? Processing. Processing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think that it's first of all just getting into a space where you are present with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then you know you could start with whatever really like works for you but I you know when I do guided meditations with my students I'll say so the question was like how do you do meditation incorporating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right um, and so I think that it's what I try to do is get them to think of like a name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is depending on what we're talking about so like if we're talking if you struggle with like mercy or struggle with let's t let's stay on the topic of tawakkul and trust in him so you sit and you're present and first you 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 know you could first connect to this heart within you and I could actually do a guided meditation with you guys now if you guys want yeah okay let's do that inshallah okay it'll be like a short one but Thank you. Okay. All right, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So let's get into a position where we're comfortable, where you're not going to be fidgeting a lot during the next few minutes. So sit in a comfortable position. And let's all say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Let's start with Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa alihi wa sahabi ajma'in. And I want you all to close your eyes. And I want you to take your right hand and put it on your heart. And now I want you, we're going to start with a few deep breaths. So we're going to inhale for four and then we're going to exhale. So inhale through your nose. Hold. One, two, three, four. Exhale through your mouth. Okay, let's do that again. Inhale through your nose. One, two, three, four. Exhale through your mouth. Let's do it again. Inhale through your nose. One, two, three. Exhale through your mouth. And I want you to continue doing this as I speak to you and guide you through this meditation. Continue taking those deep breaths. As you're doing this, I want you to connect to the fact that this very breath was granted to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That it is a gift. It is a great gift from Him. And I want you to feel this gift and I want you to feel this blessing as your lungs fill up with air and you have this ability to breathe. And I want you to, in your, in your heart, to just Alhamdulillah as you're taking these deep breaths and I want you to think of also how this body of yours is already in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it already submits to him it already follows his command every cell in your body already obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala otherwise you wouldn't be living so you are alive because of the body's submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as you connect to this body and as you connect to this, you know, breath and you connect to this being that is already in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember that it is because of submission to Allah 
that you are alive and that you are breathing. <laughs> the body itself now is teaching you how beautiful it is to submit. <laughs> Now I want to direct your attention to the most sacred, most valuable, most powerful tool that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, and that is your heart. This heart inside of you was already designed and programmed to know Allah, to connect to Allah, to seek Allah, to love Allah, to know Allah. It's in its programming whether you believe it or not, whether you are connected to it or not, it was programmed to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even when you say Allah, you feel a vibration close to your heart. That's how Allah designed this. Every letter in the Arabic language, it comes from a different place of your being. Ha comes from the top of your throat. Ha in Allah comes so at the bottom of your throat, so near to your heart. So when you say Allah, Allah, you feel that in your heart and I want you to practice that. Well, you actually have to practice, you have to say it out loud to feel it. <laughs> yeah, you have to say the ha sound. Allah. Allah You feel that? Yeah? <laughs> Continue <laughs> Continue Allah You feel that vibration? So this heart was programmed to know Allah This heart was programmed to seek Him That it responds even to His very name so whether you're in submission or not, whether you believe in Allah or not, even an atheist has a heart that is programmed to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is programmed to know Him, to trust Him, to want to love Him. This is the heart that made Ibrahim alayhi salam in a time of idolatry where his own father, you know, didn't worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, go gravitate and seek Allah. The sun is my Lord. The moon is my Lord. No, Allah is my Lord. <laughs> so it's this heart. Do you think Allah would put you in this earth and not give you a navigation system to find Him? So as you're connecting to this heart and you have your hand over this most sacred, most valuable, most powerful part within you, remember that it was already designed to look for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to feel his love. You cannot feel love. You cannot experience love with your mind. <laughs> you could gather the evidence for love, but to actually experience love, you need your heart. To experience Allah's love, you need your heart. So as you're connecting to this tool that was given to you so you can experience love, I want you to think of somebody who you know for sure loves you in this world. anybody in your life that you know for sure loves you so, or someone that has shown love to you in the past or has shown mercy to you in the past and as you think of this person I want you to like make that image stronger let's I want you to think of what it felt like for that person to look at you with love Do you remember their gaze? Do you remember the rahmah, the mercy that they had towards you? You felt it with the way they looked at you, that loving look, that gaze of rahmah, that gaze of mercy towards you. And I want you to think, what is it about that person that made you feel loved by them? And I want you to accept this love, that yes, they love you, but you now have to accept it. Like, I, I'm taking this love, I'm gonna accept it. And now I want you to remember 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love for you is greater than that person, is greater than a mother's love to her child. And as you pictured this person looking down at you, loving, looking to, at you lovingly, I want you to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just looking at you with that love. Of course, you cannot imagine how Allah looks. Of course, you cannot imagine that. But you, can, you now know what a loving gaze is. And now I want you to think of all the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was loving towards you. All the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was merciful towards you. All the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected you, guided you, molded you, and gave you what you need to be who you are today. And nothing is too small to think of or to be grateful for. And just continue thinking of all the ways Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was so near to you, so close to you, never has left you. How as he says in the Quran, my mercy encompasses all things. How has his mercy encompassed you? Remember as Rabi al-Adawiyya radiallahu anha said, I look for his love and suddenly I am filled with it. So this is the moment where you look for his love. You actively look for all the ways that he was loving towards you. All the ways that he was merciful towards you. And if you find yourself drifting off in the future or the past, bring yourself back to the present. There's no greater moment than now. And continue to do this until you're ready to open your eyes. How was that? Do more often. Okay, inshallah, we'll try to incorporate it. What was your experience? What did you feel? What came up for you? Contentment. 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 It's like after having a very stressful day, mm -hmm. it's like sometimes like it's really, it's really, it's not hard to remember all that, but it's mm -hmm. just like. I guess like our brain chooses to, unfortunately. So mm -hmm. it's like when you remember him, it's like all of a sudden, well, yeah, this day was stressful, but I'm alive, that I'm yeah. well. And I have him. Yes. So yeah. even cool. like you have no one, you have him. Hmm? So even like a person doesn't have anyone else. Yeah, you have him. Like, and yeah. that's the most important part. Like yeah. the scariest part is losing him. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, it's beautiful. Did that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, if you know someone who is in a spiral, that negative spiral of like, mm -hmm. you know, like this from Allah, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. But I've observed this. It's not just one instance, it's like their understanding is that way and it's like many instances of being let down mm -hmm. uh, that you know, no matter what they ask for, what they pray, they don't get it. How do you advise them to, you know, move towards a better understanding of this relationship with Allah without blaming them or yeah. like without sounding like you're, you're telling them your understanding is not correct or like victim blaming yeah. of sorts, like any practical tips on that? 
Yeah, I think holding a space where you show compassion towards them and validation towards their experience. Like, I think sometimes people become defensive and, and then they, when they feel like they're judged or when they feel like that person is just telling them what they need to change but without really validating the actual experience that's causing them to stay stuck. So saying things like, you know, I, I know this is hard. I know that, you know, it, it might feel like this or it might feel like that for you right now. Um, and I understand why you would feel that way and ask them how you can help them because sometimes we help people in the way they think we th in the way we think they need to be helped but sometimes we just need to ask like how can i show up for you during this time you know how can i what do you need from me <laughs> during this time how can i support you uh doing that is is really helpful and just to let them know that you're there you know because you can only do you can only tell people and show them consistently that you're there but you can't you can't really make somebody see what they what they're not ready to see so but showing up and making sure that you yourself don't also judge their experience because it's very easy to say we don't judge but a lot of times especially if we've given a person a certain amount of time to change like i've said this and i've said this and i've said this you know then we start to get frustrated and we start to be like well you know what maybe they wouldn't be judged maybe they wouldn't be in this place if they do this mm -hmm. <laughs> and then so it's almost like you know we have to take care of our own hearts too when we advise so like as we're advising them you know to remember that you know what i I'm empathy, they say empathy is different than sympathy mm. in the sense that sympathy is that you can you can feel sorry for someone's feeling for someone's experience. But empathy is that you you're putting yourself in their shoes and you understand that the only reason that you're not in their shoes is by the grace of God. <laughs> That's empathy. So sympathy is like, oh, I feel sorry for you, but like, you know, there's still that like, sense of okay well maybe if they do you can have sympathy and still assume that hey you know well they're in this situation because of this but empathy is is, is humbling it's humility it's saying ya Allah like may Allah protect me from that yeah. when you see someone struggling with something don't ever assume that you you might not be in their position really and it happens so many times to people the thing that they judge the thing that they laugh at the thing that they mock the thing that they look down upon they find themselves in that shoe in, the, in that person's shoe so um, it's tough, you know, this question of like, how can we help people who are not already changed? I get that a lot. And I think it's a, it's tough, it's a tough one because you feel helpless. You feel helpless sometimes. And, you know, I, I, I mentioned this before in my profession, you know, like I, I struggled with this early on, you know, I, when my training, when I would get, I remember getting clients who would work so hard and like, and sometimes you get client who is not ready for change. And I remember early on during my, I had supervision at the time, and my supervisor s saw me one time, you know, coming out of this uh, session that it was like, you know, I've had many sessions with this client and I would come out feeling so drained because I was putting all this effort and this person was, was just like, you know, he was not ready for change. And she, she said to me, she said, you can't work harder than the client, you know? So I remembered that. I was like, wow, like here I was, like I was trying so hard to help this person and and thinking that like okay if I just do a little more if I just do a little more but her telling me that I can't work harder than my client really helped me because it made me realize that like you know I I also they need to also step up to the plate that this when you're helping a friend you're helping a family member sometimes when you try to do everything for them it actually robs them of their their the things that they need to learn to do the work too so you do your part, you know, you, you, if you want to advise your friend, if you want to advise people in your life, yeah, do it, but make sure you remind people of your love for them. You know, like I mentioned, um, oh no, this is at a different talk, you know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he takes Mu'adh ibn Jabal's hand one time and he says to him, I love you and I advise you. <laughs> did I mention this last time? I did? Oh wow, why did it feel like yesterday? I'm like, I, I, I thought I mentioned this yesterday. So anyways, but the point is, is that in this hadith, he, it's interesting. He says, I love you first, then he advises him, which is such a beautiful thing to learn that like many times we want to advise people, but we don't make them feel loved. We don't make them feel seen. We don't make them feel heard. We just want to tell them it's, it's our own nafs too. Like, oh, I, I know what's better. I need to tell you, you know, so I could get it off my chest, <laughs> did my part, you know, got to, you know, but we need to remember that it's not about us. It's about the person in front of us. Did we make them feel seen? Did we make them feel loved? 
you know i you know you know i really love you right regardless of where you're at like to say things like that make them feel that you're not you, your love for them has not changed because of their experience yeah. you know and so tell them you're loved you're you know i'm here for you and i want the best for you and maybe do that a few times before you give advice yeah, yeah. but it's, my question was more specific to this instance of resentment towards allah oh, okay. and mm -hmm. you know then even telling them you need more tawakkul or you know, like it, it <laughs> yeah. sounds like you're coming like holier than the, the yeah sort of it's stuff. hard i think i think speaking for from your own perspective is really helpful to yeah. say like you know you know i remember one time going through this and what i did and what helped me you know um and you could say like you know what I, if I was in your shoes, I, maybe it would be really hard for me to have to work right now too. Or maybe, you know, to make them feel like it's they're not doing like it's not something that like it's a flaw on their part, or um, to make them feel like that's part of the human experience. And that's that's the thing we need more of is a shared human experience. That just because we're Muslim or we're practicing or we're trying to come closer to Allah does not take away our imperfection. Does not take away our humanness. And I always say, like, you know, as human beings, we are the bridge between, if people come to us with their struggles, we have to, we shouldn't present them with the perfection of, right away with the perfection of Islam. We are the bridge between their imperfection and Allah's perfection. So they first need to feel that they're, they're, they're with another person who's, who's, who's sharing their human experience, you know, and I think we need more humanness in our interactions can be very easy to become practicing, become religious and forget that. That at the end of the day we're all human. Yeah. Also add into that, it's like if Allah can be patient with that specific person, yeah. like who are we not to be patient with that mm -hmm. you know yeah. So I hope that will help the person yeah. who asked the question. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mentioned before how like, you know, sometimes we want to we, we expect someone to have an answer by a certain time i i did a talk on this um previously and i was saying that like when you are sitting there thinking that a person should have this by a certain time think of all the times allah was patient with you when you were doing when you needed to do something right and so it's very easy to like forget that hey you know allah is so patient with us all the time and it might not be that you're struggling with that thing but we're all struggling with something <laughs> Anyone else? Did I miss any hands? Do you have a time for one more? Yeah. Um, how do you use tawakkul? Like in my, like my experience has been if I have that level of tawakkul, then I lose my competitive edge. Like everything feels. Do you like you lose your what? Competitive edge. It feels oh. like, yeah, no matter what I do, hmm. you know, everything is being taken yeah. care of. So I'm not gonna push harder. Yeah, this is the dilemma aggressive. of Muslims, right? I'm it's not going to be aggressive, I'm not going to be competing. Oh my um, god, so yeah. So what's the balance there? Like, when do you yeah. like, really desire something mm -hmm. and go after it? Versus when do you yeah. just say, you know, it was meant to be, so like, just... Yeah, I'm, I'm smiling because, you know, um, every time that, like, if I ever teach any concept, like, on Tawakkul, or I gave a talk on Friday night, and I think I, I was talking about... Um, I was talking about being suffice with God, right? And then right away, <laughs> I got a question. They're like, "Well, then why why should I go for a pro why should I go for uh, you know my master's degree or why should I accomplish this if I, you know it's?" But he was just playing devil's advocate, you know. But I think that that's what our mind does, right? It's like, oh, okay, well, if I do this, then what about this? If I do that, then what does it mean for that? So it's it's a valid question. I think that understanding that tawakkul in Allah is not complacency <laughs> and so we have to eliminate these things because and we have to watch out for 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 ourselves when we do that because people they'll start like they'll start practicing or they'll start having more tawakkul and they they I talk about spiritual bypassing a lot where we use like Islamic concepts to get us to avoid doing the work and striving so I think it's important to make sure that you're not you're you it's like honesty with yourself I tawakkul, you know, we always use the expression of tie your camel, right, mm -hmm. first. So you do your part. You don't put have trust in Allah and then you don't put any effort. And so you just have this awareness that Allah knows, Allah is aware of the effort that I put in. And uh, the strong believer is better than the weak believer. This is something that, you know, strength in any form, right? I mean, like working to be better, striving to be better, striving to improve, striving to work on ourselves and grow. That's essential. And so we are we are a community of 
if the day of judgment is falling upon us and you're planting a sapling, this, a small plant, to still plant it. This is the advice of Prophet Muhammad So we can't, we can't say, oh, I have tawakkul and you know, I'm going to be complacent. No, you have tawakkul, meaning what? If you're actually, it's, it's a little bit like contradictory, right? Because when we're depending on ourselves, we're so competitive. But when we depend on Allah, we stop being competitive. Well, competitive, you know, I'm saying like working hard, right? Yeah. But it's interesting because before you were depending on your limited self. But then when I depend on who, is, who has an infinite supply of what I need, then I become complacent. It doesn't make sense, right? It's almost like, like there's, there's, a, there's a false, um, a paradox, yeah. It doesn't make sense. So if actually, if anything, it's because of your dependence on Allah, the one who has an infinite supply of what you need, the one who is limitless, the one who is al-awwal wal akhru the beginning and the end, the one who has, who is the source of everything and the creator of everything, then you should actually work harder because you're like, man, I have access to a lot. <laughs> you know, so I think we have to like, it's good that, you know, we ask questions like this because it assesses how it helps us like confront these um, yes. False beliefs that we have. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll stop here then. Inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi